I'm going to be talking a bit about some work we've been doing in Jules. Um, it's part of the Hadley Center family of climate models. It serves as the land surface in those models um, and has dynamic global vegetation in it. Um, so I also would like to thank many of you who are in this audience because a lot of what I'll be talking about um, is based on some work that was done a few years ago trying to improve our inclusion of traits uh, in, in Jules. So yeah, as I said, Jules is a, is a land surface model that represents the turbulent exchange of carbon dioxide and methane with the atmosphere. And as Stephen introduced a few minutes ago, um, it was initially created to be part of the climate model, so it was made to represent turbulent exchanges of heat and energy, um, so that it does that as well. Um, traditionally, it had five plant functional types, a broadleaf tree, a needleleaf tree, C3 grass, C4 grass, and shrubs. And um, it, it's part of the UK Earth System model. So you can see all these different parts of uh, the Earth system that interact in this model. This is what will be used in the CMIP-6 experiments that are coming up soon. Um, so we have aerosols and atmospheric chemistry, um, terrestrial and aquatic ecosystems all working together. So this is really exciting because it's a great tool for looking at um, global change and trying to understand future, uh, how things might change in the future. Um, but it's also a challenge um, because Jules, as I said, it, it's the land surface and it represents the vegetation, um, but it's used for just so many different things. So uh, we use it for annual updates to the Global Carbon Project. Um, it's used in these climate change projections to see how climate will change all over the world. And there's also the land surface and the UK um, weather forecasting system. And so there's just a lot of constraints on, on the developments that we put into the model. So then we go from this like really exciting thing where, where um, right here it says on this picture of the UK Earth System model, one thing changes everything. And I, I, was, I was thinking of like the um, Lord of the Rings reference as, as well, but Michael used that yesterday. One, one ring unites them all. Um, but so yeah, all of a sudden it's like, ah, oh, one thing changes everything. So you make one little change in the model, it changes where the vegetation is. That has feedbacks with the atmosphere and the circulation, and then all of a sudden you have um, you know, crop fail failures in India in the, in the climate projections. And so you have to be really certain of all the, all the developments that actually make it their way into the final, the final product. So that's kind of the context for the developments that have been going on. Um, but obviously we want to improve the simulation of the terrestrial carbon cycle. We want to represent more diversity in plant types and how they respond to climate. So what we've been doing over the past few years is including um, some of these trait trade-offs and updated parameters based on, on information from literature and from databases like TRI. Um, also trying to represent more dynamic responses in um, processes like photosynthesis and respiration um, in response to temperature. So in the end, we want to increase our confidence in future responses of vegetation and the carbon cycle to climate change. Um, but then we also just don't want to break the model at the end of the day. So uh, this is an overview of what I'll be talking about for the next 20 minutes or so. Um, first, I'll start with kind of some basics of how we've been updating parameters to represent trade-offs um, in joules. Then I'll talk about some temperature responses of photosynthesis and respiration that we've tried to include. And then I'll ask, this is, it seems like a slightly controversial question, but do, the, do traits help? Um, and you know, I, I probably wouldn't be here if the answer to that was no, so um, don't, don't worry. Um, <laughs> uh, I'll talk a bit about future vegetation and climate change in the, in the model, and then just some things that have come to mind over the past couple of days, um, well, and indeed over the past few years, of, what we need to be doing next um, for Earth system models. So starting with some um, updated trait information in joules, as has been pointed out, um, traits are a fundamental part of these land surface models, but how have we been trying to update the relationships in the model? Um, so as I said at the beginning, joules or originally had five plant functional types. Um, kind of the first obvious thing to do was to split those into evergreen and deciduous. It seems like the like, most basic distinction that, that you would want to make. Um, so we've used some, some data from tri leaf mass per unit area, nitrogen on a mass basis, and leaf lifespan. 
Uh, so originally, we had the plot, uh, the plot on the bottom shows where Jules was originally with these traits. So um, for the leaf economic spectrum, we didn't really have a spectrum. We had like, a, a, I don't know, a binary system more like. Um, so needle leaf trees were down here on the conservative side and everything else was more on the acquisitive side. Um, <coughs> and then if you look at the trade-off between leaf lifespan and LMA, uh, again, we had either um, grasses and broadleaf trees, which were, um, had a, a short leaf lifespan and low L LMA, um, and then you just jump straight up to the um, evergreen, evergreen um, species, which had, yeah, we're just, there was no, again, there was no spectrum there. So with the, uh, so now we've got more of a, a spectrum represented. Again, these are, are static um, traits. So as, as Peter was just talking about, this isn't including any kind of dynamic response. But at least we have um, a range of um, approaches that, the, that are observed in nature in, the, in these plant functional types. And also the leaf lifespan um, relationship against LMA. Leaf lifespan isn't just a parameter that's put into the model. It's an emergent property. Um, that depends on things like the phenology, the growth rate of the leaves, and the um, turnover, turnover rate of the leaves. So these were things that were adjusted um, in order to give this more observed relationship between leaf lifespan and LMA. So that was the first, the first change. Oh, and then the other thing, which uh, you know has has happened over the past few years, is I've become slightly obsessed with large, um, because it's uh, the the needle leaf deciduous PFT was like the one where, like, there's really not that many needle leaf deciduous tr species in the world. I'm not an ecologist, but I think that's true. Um, and so I've just yeah I've become quite obsessed with larch. So I'll, there'll be a few more pictures of those throughout the talk. <laughs> Uh, so the next thing was to update our uh, VC max relationship with leaf nitrogen. So previously, this was a relationship between um, the leaf nitrogen, which was m given as nitrogen per unit carbon, which isn't something that people probably measure very often, um, and then multiplied by some scaling uh, coefficient. And so now we've included the new traits of nitrogen on the mass basis and the LMA. Um, to update the VC max using the slope and intercept uh, relationships from Kotke et al. in 2009, um, because many of those plant functional types are really similar to the ones in Joules. So the effect of that is shown here. Um, the, the green bars are the um, observed VC max given in the, the Kotke et al. paper from 2009. The red is where Jules was pr uh, previously, and the black is the updated VC max. So we have higher, higher VC max for most PFTs, um, which yeah, generally has increased the productivity in the model. Then the next thing is, um, so now we have a, a broadleaf evergreen plant functional type, but it makes sense to maybe separate this into a temperate and a tropical version. Um, you know, a, a, this was alluded to in the previous talk, the issue of the Amazon dieback. And so, you know, you think at the very least we could have a, a tropical tree that's specific to the tro tropical regions. So, uh, so this was, a, we got this PF2 with a few adjustments. So adjusted the quantum efficiency to get lower light use efficiency in the temperate PFT. Um, the temperate one has uh, thicker and longer lived leaves. So here um, is the temperate broadleaf evergreen tree, and the tropical broadleaf evergreen tree is, um, is here, so not so different on the leaf, leaf ec economic spe spectrum, but they are more distinct in the leaf lifespan spectrum. Um, then some other changes, such as sensitivity to VPD and shallower roots in the um, temperate broadleaf evergreen trees. So all of these changes um, were how we went from five, five PFTs to nine, so still not you know, not a huge uh, em emergent prediction of dynamic trait c combinations, but still an improvement. So the second, second thing that uh, we've been working on over the past few years is including a temperature response to photosynthesis and respiration. Um, so it's not just static. So starting with the uh, variation of the response of VCmax and Jmax with growth temperature, 
based on the study of Kagi and Nora in 2007. Uh, so they found a strong dependence of this optimal temperature with growth, growth temperature as well as the ratio of Jmax to Vcmax. So, um, uh, so this was included in Joules by Lena Mercado and she um, did uh, sim simulations of Joules with 22 different GCMs. So the climate from these 22 GCMs were used to run the model and then calculated the change in carbon by 2100 um, based on the, the change at or the carbon in vegetation and soils at 2100 minus the carbon that was present at 1860 when the model simulation began. And so uh, what you see is there, there are two ways of, of representing this uh, adjustment of, of the optimal temperature. There's a spatial effect, so you can have um, spatially varying optimal temperatures that are just static in time. Um, and then you can also allow the model to adjust that optimal temperature as the climate evolves. So, so the left shows what happens with just the spatial effect only across these 22 GCMs, and the right shows the, uh, the, the difference between the simulation with spatial only and a simulation with the temporal and the spatial variation. So basically that shows the, temp uh, the Im impact of the temporal variation and the optimal temperature. So um, over the period of this simulation with just temporal variation, you get um, about 38 petagrams of carbon difference by 2100. And if you include sp uh, spatial only, you get 78 petagrams of carbon. And so this was, um, so that's about twice as much as from the temporal variation. And overall, by including this, we have a difference in carbon storage in the model of 116 petagrams. So obviously this is a really important process to include. Um, we've, we've also been working on updating leaf respiration response to temperature based on data from um, Owen Atkin and many others. Um, and so basically what, what we have is a um, leaf dark respiration curve, which is the default in joules, which is this beige line. And then um, two different representations that we've been trying in joules um, based on data where, so you have an exponential increase in the leaf dark respiration with temperature. Um, and this can depend on the, the growth temperature, so the bottom plot shows some different responses depending on the growth temperature um, in, in a specific location. And so you end up with a quite different um, plant respiration distribution than you would without this, this response. Um, and obviously this greatly increases the respiration um, from the plants and decreases the net primary productivity, so this is something that is um, currently being evaluated more. So now, now um, back to the question of do, do the traits help? Um, so to do this, we've done a lot of evaluation. And what I'll be focusing on for the next few slides is um, some evaluations of, of just including the traits and going from the five to nine PFTs. Um, this, is, this is something that happens in the modeling world where you've got lots of people working on different things. So we haven't yet gotten a version of the model where we've put together um, all of the changes I've just discussed. But so we'll start with just the nine the nine PFTs, um, and we've tried to evaluate over a range of scales. So we look at um, site level simulations where you just run the model at a flux tower and see how it does, going up to global level scale, scales and looking at um, your global, global fluxes, um, comparing to different biomes and that sort of thing. So um, the first thing that was done was a site evaluation of the GPP at several FlexNet sites. Um, so the blue line, oh, sorry, the red lines on here are the um, jewels with just the standard five PFTs. The orange lines are um, jewels when we only include the new trait information. So the updated in mass, LMA, leaf lifespan, and VC max. It's a little hard to tell the difference between the red and the orange, but basically the orange is always the one that's higher because as I showed, the VC max is higher with all of those PFTs. Um, yeah, and so if, if all we do is include the trait data, then that improves GPP at um, only five of the sites. Um, but then if we also include other changes, like having the um, updating the phenology, updating the, uh, the difference between the temperate and the tropical uh, evergreen trees, then we get the blue lines, um, which now has an improvement at, at nine of the sites out of 13. So that's pretty good. Um, the exceptions are kind of not surprising, so 
Um, the, Bond, the Bondville site, which is this one, is a crop, and we don't do very well at that site, but these aren't crop PFTs, so that's not surprising. Um, it's not great at the Morgan Monroe site, which is a, a broadleaf deciduous forest that gets kind of uh, relatively warm in the summertime, and so there's some temperature limitation um, in the model, which actually the work that Lena Mercado has done would possibly help with this kind of response. And then we don't do that great um, at the two tropical sites, unfortunately. But again, um, not too surprising because no changes were really made to model hydraulics or any of that. And so this really points out that you, know, you, can, get, you can get far from using one set of traits, but obviously there's a whole range of data that, that could be used in the model to improve it. And um, this kind of work has really highlighted that there's a, a problem with soil moisture stress um, that needs to be addressed in the model. So I mean, I think. When you're doing model evaluation, like you want everything to look really perfect and wonderful at the end, but actually it's, it's kind of good when it doesn't because it means there's more, there's more work to do and there's more things to learn about how the world works. So, um, And I was quite happy to see that the Larch site was the most improved out of all of those, so that was very good. <laughs> uh, so then we did some global evaluation. So in those, in those previous runs, we told the model what kind of vegetation should be at each site. Um, the next step was to let the model run and predict global vegetation distributions, and that's what, and then these are the GPP, NPP, and carbon and vegetation stored um, in these runs with, with the um, dynamic vegetation turned on. And these are separated into biomes. The biome map is shown on the, on the bottom right. Um, and so what's really great news is that the GPP is improved for all the biomes which is nice. Um, the NPP is, is still pretty good, but it's actually too high now. Um, and, and some biomes, like this is the tropical forest, it's too high there. Um, and it's too high in, in um, tropical and mixed for tropical savannas and mixed forests as well. Um, but as I showed previously also with, with the um, updated leaf dark respiration uh, response to temperature, that increased the respiration. Um, so yeah, something that still needs to be done is, like I said, combining all of these things and, and seeing what the net effect of all of these developments is. <coughs> this is what the, um, project, what the um, predicted vegetation looks like. So on the left is um, from satellite observed vegetation distribution. There's broadleaf trees, needle leaf trees, grasses, shrubs, and bare soil. On the right is Joule C1, so this is the um, carbon, ve carbon cycle configuration um, based on the default old um, five PFTs. So we had several biases which are evident, such as um, no broadleaf trees outside of the tropics. Um, the boreal forest was pretty wimpy and didn't expand, extend very far um, longitudinal, longitudinally. And then there was a huge uh, high bias in shrubs at high latitudes. So uh, with, the, with the updated physiology and, and nine PFTs, we get a few more broadleaf trees outside of the tropics. It's still not perfect, but it's better. Um, the boreal forest is much better, and we've removed that really high um, bias in the, in the shrubs. Um, and once again, the larch did really well. As well, I mean, they did all right, <laughs> so, so I was pleased. Um, this was one of those things I just spent like hours worrying about them and how are they doing. Um, <laughs> so um, it turns out that that trade-off between um, SLA and leaf lifespan is really important for enabling them to, to survive in, these, um, in this cold continental climate. And then also, this is without uh, nitrogen, a nitrogen cycle. Um, in a moment, I'll show you some results <coughs> with the nitrogen cycle turned on. Um, but they, they, they're able to, uh, they have a higher rate of nitrogen that's, that's conserved when um, the leaves drop in the winter. So that was also a, a thing that enabled the larch to do, to do fairly well at the high latitudes. Uh, yes, here I am with my family in Switzerland. I dragged them you know, through the <coughs> rain on a rainy day um, to, to see the 700-year-old larch that I thought was really amazing. Um, OK, so what what's hap might happen in the future? Um, these are some simulations now. With, with joules. On the left is RCP 2.6, so um, <coughs> high mitigation scenario. On the right is 8.5. Uh, 
Um, I'm not going to go into detail, but basically it's showing, you know, like there's a benefit to mitigation because we'll have more carbon on the land, um, more trees, um, which is really interesting, but actually these exact maps are probably wrong um, <laughs> because it's only including car carbon and there's no nutrient limitation in those simulations. So, um, yeah, Jules has a carbon cycle, obviously, as I've been talking about. Um, but in the UK ESM for CMUP6, we have, we have a version that, will, that has a nitrogen limitation as well. So um, nitrogen can limit the assimilation of carbon and turnover um, of soil, soil carbon. Um, it's quite different. It was really nice to hear Rosie's talk about um, how nitrogen limitation is done in CLM. It's quite different in joules. Um, I think it's good to have these different approaches so that we can kind of understand. Um, I don't know. It's nice to have a diversity of approaches for for understanding what's happening. So in joules, there's a fixed C to N ratio. Um, when the plants assimilate carbon, then, then it's determined if they had enough nitrogen to meet that increased carbon into the system. If they don't, then the extra carbon um, goes out through exudates, and it's as if it was never assimilated in the first place. And so that's how the, that's how the limitation comes in in, in the model. Um, so, so if we include the nitrogen limitation, then the carbon stored in vegetation by 2100 is reduced by, by one third. There's not really any way to know if that's right or not, but it's good that it reduced at least. We're going in the right direction. Um, it's also quite interesting to see what, what are the carbon feedbacks um, in the model. So these, these are experiments where the atmospheric CO2 is increased by 1% per year. Um, if you only include um, so if you only allow the vegetation to see the radiative effects of the increased CO2, then you get a picture of the carbon climate feedback. Um, and that's negative because it's mostly um, warming and drying in some places, so the vegetation doesn't like that, so you lose carbon on land. On the other hand, if you let the model, um, sorry, if you let the vegetation only experience the um, like CO2 fertilization impact of the increased CO2, um, then that's the carbon concentration feedback, and that's positive. Um, so previously in HADGEM 2 es which is the previous iteration of, of this model, um, the carbon climate, carbon climate feedback was negative 30 gigatons of carbon per year. It's much higher now in this version. I'm not really sure why, um, but, but that's interesting. The nitrogen cycle doesn't have an impact on that, so in these plots, um, the red line is joules with carbon, only the black is when you turn on the nitro nitrogen limitation. And then on the right is the um, carbon concentration feedback. So in HADGEM2, yes, that was 1.16 gigatons of carbon per extra ppm of CO2 in the atmosphere. Um, it's slightly higher, but not by much in the, in the new version of joules. And if you have nitrogen limitation, then it's um, about 0.8, which puts it kind of right in the middle of where the models were for the, for the last um, CMIT-5 experiment. So, um, yeah, so what might be some things that, that we can do next? Um, I've been just really inspired over the last few days listening to all the um, new information that's out, the old and new information that's out there, and there's just, I mean, there's too many things to do, really. Um, we could really use some work on the respiration from leaf root and wood pools in, in the model, trying to have more mechanistic understanding of what controls respiration rates. Um, improved tundra PFTs, this is something that's really important because there's going to be so much climate change at high latitudes. We really need to understand how vegetation will change there. Uh, there's a huge need for improved representations of soil moisture stress, including more hydraulic information in the model. Below ground processes, including dynamic roots, um, having just more information on roots in general would be really great. And then land management, so successional stages. You know, at this point, we still just have, have one um, tree that grows up in a, in a plot, and, it, and all the trees in the, in the grid cell are the same size. Um, and that's something that's being worked on currently, but the more information we can have on successional stages and how traits vary with succession would be really useful. Um, and then something I'm really interested in right now is, is linking all of this to kind of th the things that, that matter to people, like how much food will we be able to produce in the future? How will the overall carbon cycle change? How, are, how will the water cycle change? Um, I think, you know, there's really big societal questions that we can answer with these models. Um, and I think there's a lot of ex excitement over that right now. 
Uh, oh, yes, and tremendous opportunity for us to just keep working together. So again, I'm just really grateful to have been invited to this, to this um, meeting because it's been really good. So just to wrap up quickly, um, yeah, we included a few traits, leaf mass per unit area and mass, VC max, and um, leaf lifespan. Um, we're trying to include some observed responses of uh, photosynthesis and respiration. Yes, traits, traits do help. Um, and yeah, we're still trying to understand how vegetation might change in the future, but adding more representation of nutrient cycles definitely helps. Um, and I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you.